be here. This is a dream come true. I never thought 50 years ago that I would be standing here. And that it's happening, finally, where we can actually take VR and change the world. This is my first time in mainland China. I'm actually 74 years old, <laughs> but uh, in all the travels in the world, this is the first time. And so I began my journey in China in Shenzhen, and it's an amazing place. It's like drinking from a fire hose, because so much is happening here, and I'm so excited and so grateful that I can be here with you. And Ming Chi, thank you for this great opportunity. And Alvin. Alvin was my student in 1991. Isn't he done a great job? So Alvin actually asked me if I would give a little bit of history about VR. Because it was sort of lonely at the beginning. There weren't too many people working on it. So I'm calling my talk, Hiking the VR Trail. Now, at the beginning, there are only really three people on this trail. You see on the left, this was Mort Hiley. Mort was actually a filmmaker, and he decided we need more in film than just seeing a passive scene. That it needed to be multi sensory. We needed to have three dimensional sound and wind blowing in your face and smell and all of those kinds of things. We started building our arcades called Sensoramas. Now, it didn't go anywhere, and very expensive to build, and uh, you couldn't build too many of them. Now, the second person on the trail was Ivan Sutherland. Ivan was a computer scientist at both Harvard and uh, at MIT and at, um, at uh, the University of Utah. And he was very interested in how in the world can we make computers more interactive, because we're really on the other side of this piece of glass the screen, isn't there any, any way that we can break the glass and go inside and interact with the computer that way? And now you see Lieutenant Furness on the right. I was an officer in the Air Force, a young officer, and my job was to solve problems having to do with pilots and fighter airplanes. So really the, the problems I was trying to solve had to do with this kind of machine. Here you had an energy delivery machine. This aircraft had 50 computers on board and one operator. So this one pilot had to interact with all those computers while flying the speed of sound, twice the speed of sound, trying to interact with 300 switches, 75 displays, 11 switches on the control stick, and nine switches on the throttle, while being shot at at the same time. This was a busy office. But the problem was there wasn't a very good interface between the pilot and the outside world. For example, let me give you two examples. One was you had to aim the whole airplane, to aim the systems of the airplane, and to the air, to the ground. And my job was to determine a better way to build cockpits. So I decided, well, if the pilot actually sees what is of interest, why don't we just use that information? Maybe we could come up with a way to track and position in order to take that information and put it in the aircraft. So uh, what I started working on was what we call a, and this, uh, I'm going to go over here to the helmet tracking system, is a helmet mounted sight. In 1969, we built this helmet mounted sight to track head position. So that wherever the pilot looked, that information went into the air data system, into the missile seekers, so we sort of solved some of this and tracking things and making the interface better. But there was another problem, and that was there were so many instruments in the cockpit that we couldn't make a hole big enough to put a video display in order to use our sensors. Because we had sensors we could see at night, no light on the television, we had the forward looking infrared, but the picture was so small in the cockpit because of the space, I probably couldn't see it. So I thought, well, why can't we just make the image a virtual image? Why don't we take a very small picture and then magnify it, collimate it, put it in optical infinity, so it's a big screen. 
as you move your head around, it would move with you. And there you see in 1967, the world's first helmet mounted display. Now, of course, these two were developed to solve problems independently, the display problem and the tracking problem. But then I decided, well, why don't we put the two together and create what I call a visually coupled system? And so we did this. In 1971, you see this amazing helmet, which actually is a see-through display, but also is a virtual reality display. It can work either way. Depending upon the transparency of the visor that we can select, we can adjust even. So here you have a paraboloid with miniature television picture tubes on the side of the back of the helmet. We lay the image over the top of the helmet with fiber optic bones, and then project into this paraboloid. So that the pilot, when the display is turned off, it looks like a normal world. When the display is turned on, you have this field of view that's superimposed over the outside world, or it becomes a virtual world. So with that, we can now look off foresight. That means as we track our head position, our sensor would go in that same direction. And then we get the visual input from that sensor and overlaying instrumentation, so it's like looking through the cockpit with a picture window. And we found that not only that, we could take the whole cockpit, all the instruments and displays, and put them on that. So this led over a period of years to the notion of a super cockpit. The super cockpit is a cockpit that you wear. You put on a magic helmet, magic flight suit, magic gloves. And what you have now is three-dimensional information that goes in the eyes, in the ears, and to the hands. And we were building this. And you see here an artist concept of these different systems. So that we have now this binocular, binocular projection with holographic lenses in order to create the visual scene, binaural sound to create the audio, speech input, 16 bit tracking system, eye tracking, and tactile displays, all in this super cockpit. So the idea was to take this standard cockpit where you had 300 switches and 75 displays and so forth and turn it into something that looks like this because this is a picture and a picture is worth a thousand words or many, many thousands of words. We fused all the information from those 50 computers into this one scene so the pilots instantly <coughs> could tell what was going on. It could point at things, speak things, look at things in order to interact with so this was a super cockpit, and this was conceptually being developed in the mid-80s. But before that, we started doing experiments in this immersive virtual environment with what I call the Darth Vader system. Our Darth Vader helmet display, we started building in 1979, and we turned it on for the first time in 1981. It gave us a 120-degree field of view by 60 degree field of view, stereographic, 16 bit electromagnetic tracking system, speech input, binaural sound, and uh, we turned it on for the first time. It was an amazing day. We had this hooked to eight computers, it took eight max computers to run this thing. We had two Evans and Sullivan picture systems, one to draw the left eye, one to draw the right eye, and, uh, and water cooled electronics. Display electronics was using miniature cathode ray tubes with beams. And we'd um, scan a 1200-line raster, and then the retrace might be degraded to the vector graph. And so the electronics ran so hot we had to water cool them. But that was what we were working on in the PCAS. And this proved to us that we could do it, at least in the laboratory. Now, this was a several million dollar system. The hell it cost a million dollars by itself. But we proved that we could do this. And that led to, eventually, to lighter weight on this. And you see the one in the middle here, the Agilai, which actually weighs less than normal Air Force helmet and has a lot of this electronics built in. So over the years, over the first 23 years of my career, we developed what is known today as virtual reality, trying to solve some problems with modern cockpits. Well, what happened in 1989 was a transformation in my life. As a result of television programs, I was talking about the super cockpit, uh, and network television programs showed this. 
And uh, I was then received phone calls. I received a phone call from a mother and said, I saw this program on television and my child has cerebral palsy. Is there anything you can do with that technology to help my child? Then I had a surgeon call. He says, I'm a thoracic surgeon. I'm inside this patient trying to do a graft with an aorta. And my navigation system, which is a CT scan, was on a light box on the wall. Is there any way to take that and superimpose them inside the patient? I was getting three or four phone calls a week from people who said, can you do that? And my answer to them was, well, yeah, actually. You could do that sort of easy compared to what I'm trying to do. And I realized at that time we were onto something really big. This virtual reality thing was transformational. So in 1989, I left the Department of Defense and decided to beat my sword into a plowshare and become an academic. And I started a laboratory called the Human Interface Technology Lab that would take these technologies, these virtual reality technologies, and develop them for medicine and education, other enterprise applications, scientific visualization, and so forth. And that's, of course, when Alvin shows up, uh, one of the very early people in the lab. So the University of Washington was very receptive to this. And I had an interesting mandate. It was not only to be able to uh, build this technology, but also to get it out in the world where it make a difference. The first thing I built was a, a personal library display. It turns out nobody knew what virtual reality was. But here you see one of my <coughs> patents, the very first consumer virtual display. You know, the patent was issued in 92, and what you would do is you could now wear this uh, display, which looked like, actually looked like a hallway now, but you wear this display, and you see a one meter screen at three meters away. And this would now give you ability to watch a video. Uh, you can see the outside world at the same time you look at the directions. Well, this became a disaster from a commercial standpoint. It, cost, it was too expensive. It cost $799, <laughs> interestingly enough. Uh, but all you could do is watch Oprah or television, broadcast television. It wasn't too wonderful. So, but what we did find as a result of this is there was a segment of the population that started buying these things. And these were dentists. Dentists started buying these displays in order to put them on the patients to entertain them while they inflict pain on these patients. And uh, the dentist said, this is wonderful because the patients aren't complaining now and they, we can get on with, with what we're trying to do, but they created a whole new problem. And that was, we couldn't get them to leave because they're in the middle of this movie. They said, we can't leave now, this is the good part. You know? But uh, what happened beyond that was this. Little children coming into the dentist. And you see this little girl who's playing Nintendo while the dentist is working on the television. And then the children would go home and say, Mommy, when can I go back to the dentist again to wear those glasses? When did you ever hear a child want to go to the dentist? So that was remarkable. And it started us in a whole journey of using the DR as an analgesic for pain. We went to the children's hospital with patients who had leukemia, children who were in very much pain, extracting bone marrow samples and things like that, when they were in DR. Couldn't believe it. Then we started getting into burn pain. And after a period of time, this became a transformational thing, a non-pharmaceutical way to treat not only acute pain, but chronic pain. And this is in particular an area we want to try to apply to a great extent in this new institute. So, as it turns out, of course, there were real problems with the displays. We're still using matrix element displays. And I decided at that time especially, they were really low resolution, very low luminance. We had to solve that problem. So why not just write the image directly on the retina of the eye? What if you took a beam, a very low energy beam, a laser beam, coherent beam, and then you scanned it rapidly across the retina directly? There is no image anywhere in the system except on the retina of the eye. This was transformational. The resolution would be unlimited. The field of view would be unlimited. This color saturation would be unlimited. And so we started building that. It's one of my patents, the virtual retina display. So instead of having a matrix of pixels, we had one pixel, but moved it really fast. A lot of people said this would never work, but it did work. And we spun off a company called Microvision. 
And indeed, that became the foundational technology for Magic Leap. One of my students was um, as the CTO and co-founder of Magic Leap. And this is one of the technologies I also want to bring to China and bring to the Institute. Direct retinal scanning. It will change for everything. As a matter of fact, even 20 years ago, it's been over 20 years, when this was invented and demonstrated, it transcended anything that exists today. So here's the virtual retinal display optical bench. Interesting thing happened. One day, a, a guy came in to, um, to look at it. He said, I've been hearing about this virtual retinal display. Can I see it? So we set him down at the optical bench. This was just a one-eye view at the time. And he looked into to the display, into the optics, and he could see this and scanned on his retina. He said, wow, that's, that's really amazing. So we're running, relaying the, the, the laser, uh, modulated laser information up through a fiber optic, single fiber, to a scanning mirror that would then uh, project into the eye. So he sees this amazing photograph uh, or, or image. And, um, and then he decided, and then we told him, okay, take off your spectacles. And he did. He says, I can still see this as clearly as I could without my spectacles. It turns out we don't need spectacles. And, and deviations of perturbations in the eye, we bypass. But then on the other hand, uh, what he did then after that is he looked with his other eye. He said, wait a minute, what's going on here? And I can see with my blind eye. We said, why? He said, I'm blind in my left eye, and I can still see that image. And that opened a whole new area of research for us. National Science Foundation funding, where we looked at low vision patients, and it was working. Even patients with macular degeneration disease. It was getting through into the receptors of the eye in ways that broadband light and traditional light was not getting there. So these kind of things you find out as you go along. One of the contemporaries of Alvin was Mark Millinghurst. Mark Millinghurst is one of my PhD students in electrical engineering, along with Hiro Kato, a visiting professor from Japan, actually created what we now know today as video-based augmented reality. And we started the first company, AR Toolworks. They would actually take fiducials and track those fiducials and then have then virtual images on those. And we just sold AR Toolworks um, in 2015. Another company, Dacry. But these were the kind of things that were happening in my lab. And I can't say it was just me, because there are all kinds of pioneers that, uh, that were involved at the time. There were just sort of three at the beginning on that trail, but others sort of began to together. And now we're sort of at a juncture, aren't we? Now they're, you're joining me on this trail. Hopefully I can last out a little bit longer and see all the cool stuff you're going to make. But, but um, it's a thrill to be able to be joined by all of you in this. So, this transformation in VR, uh, that comes with VR, takes us from being passive observers, even being first-person players, where you see this transformation that's taken with kids. When they kids started playing computer games, they stopped watching TV. And then, of course, when VR comes along, now you're on the other side of the glass. That changes everything. Okay, so we've learned a lot about VR. My time is up. Uh, and you know all these things. Alvin has mentioned them. It's amazing what happens. When you walk at the speed of light, you can shrink yourself to the size of a molecule. We teach and we've taught with it. We know that you can retain this, that children are, uh, are able to learn faster and better and retain more. So, and it's a lot of fun. Same thing. The marketplace is growing. Uh, um, I have to say that I had a, a, a lot to do with this, with a $120 billion market by 2020. But I'm not the only one. But it feels gratifying to know that finally that has happened. Let me mention just a couple of things before finishing about the new institute. I'm so excited about this. This is a dream come true. I wish you could have been at that breakfast I had with Alvin Graham in Seattle uh, one morning when he sat down with me and he said, Tom, he said, what if you could bring your dream team together of the best people in the world that you've worked with over the years, your dream team, and you would work on those projects you've always wanted to work on where there was no limit. And you could do that in China where 
there's this incredible marketplace, an incredible place to pick up and use that technology. And I said, really? <laughs> I can do that? He said, yes, let's do that. And that became the journey to start this institute, which you've seen happen today. This is a historical moment. And what we want to do is build an ecosystem where we are bringing together teaching, research, and the diffusion with the goal of making this the best, premier VR laboratory in the world. To be the magnet to bring students, um, professionals, researchers from around the world. And to also build satellite locations. But the locus is in China and in the Shenzhen. I'm convinced that this is the place where it's going to happen. And uh, because of all of you and because of what's happening around us in the government, has been stated before. So I have a number of my colleagues with me, two of my colleagues who were on the advanced team uh, putting this together. But we've identified 147 already who want to or we feel will be a part of this in one way. And 47 institutions that would be a part of it. And we're calling ourselves these impatient optimists. Because we want to get on with it and do some great things in the world. So in the end, we want to build a starship. A starship to move our minds to other worlds where we can learn and grow and be happy and solve all the problems in the world. And that's what this is all about in the end, is living mankind. Living ourselves. Thank you. This is a special message.